Christ afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. This is God's word. Let us pray. Father in heaven, again, we thank you for your mercies towards us, privilege of reading the scriptures, the privilege of sitting in your presence under your word for you to be our teacher for you to regulate our conscience, for you to show us what to believe in, and grant that we as the people of God will respond with faith in what you reveal, with obedience to your commands. Grant me as as the preacher to, to accurately set forth the teaching of Scripture and grant to us as a congregation wisdom to discern truth from error and to follow your word and to grow in Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Now, as we begin today, and we've made some progress in this letter, I do want to just remind us of the purpose of Colossians as a whole and the nature of the false teaching that Paul is combating. Why do we have this letter? What what is it we're trying to accomplish in going through this letter? What's the situation that made this letter necessary for Paul to to write? As I've already said, we don't know the specifics of the false teaching. But Paul does highlight a few things. One, he originates that this false teaching began with people as opposed to God. This doesn't come from God's word, he says. And he also talks about that it promises spiritual growth by means of observing man-made rules. Look at a couple verses in chapter 2 for a moment. Chapter 2, verse 22. This is where Paul touches on the human origin of of this false teaching that had invaded the church at Colossae. Chapter 2, verse 22, Paul says, These rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. So whatever it was that was being circulated in this church, we know this for sure, it came from men. It came from humans. It didn't carry with it the authority of God's word. And second, on its false promise of spiritual growth. You're still in chapter 2. Look at verse 16. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. Skip down to verse 20. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of the world, why, as though you still belonged to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Finally, verse 23, such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom, but their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. So notice that the false teachers are coming along and they're saying, look, if you want to live in Christ, if you want to overcome temptation and sensual indulgence, just follow this religious program. Had something to do with Jewish rules, with the new moon festivals and the Sabbath days. Had something to do with matters of abstinence. Don't touch this. Don't taste that. Don't handle that. But Paul says, look, if if they're trying to get you to the point where you overcome sin, 
Just by imposing this man-made list of religious observances, it can't get you there. It will, the car will run out of gas before you ever reach the destination. And worse, it has the potential of taking them away from Christ, the one who would be their source of spiritual growth. And that brings me then to the purpose of this book. He writes this book to show them that Christ and the gospel are not only sufficient for salvation, how we enter the Christian life, But Christ and his gospel are sufficient for our spiritual growth as well, for our perseverance in the faith. We begin the Christian life by faith in the gospel, and that gospel and its grace are sufficient to continue Christian growth among us and to bring us to the end of our lives. And and, and Paul is careful here. He's not disavowing any form of of holiness or saying, look, when you live in Christ, it's going to look like something. You might abstain from certain things. You might stay away from certain things. You're definitely going to avoid sin. Paul's very insistent. That's active. You're going to, you're going to reflect Christ in your life. But he says, here's how you're going to get there by being grounded in Christ and the gospel and not in these man-made systems of religious growth and spiritual fulfillment. So, as we come to the end of Colossians 1, we're coming very close to where Paul begins his direct assault on that kind of thinking. You notice those verses we read a moment ago, they all came from chapter 2. That's where Paul really turns his guns on the false teachers. But before he gets there, he's going to say one more thing to, to really lay the basis for what's coming. Before he goes on the attack, he lays a basis for their sufficiency in Christ. He's already done so by talking about the work of the gospel among them, about what Christ will be for them as he's central in creation and redemption, how how salvation becomes and remains a reality in our everyday lives. And here he's going to make one more point that focuses on his ministry to the Colossians. In the verses we read today, chapter 1, 24, and all the way to 2, 5, Paul describes his ministry in a way that sounds very much like a mission statement, where he defines his goal, where he describes his strategy, where he says, here's how I'm going to minister among you so that we can get you to the goal of living in Christ. I imagine many of you like to eat at Chick-fil-A. Do you know that Chick-fil-A, as a corporation, has a mission statement? It reads like this. The Chick-fil-A corporate purpose is to glorify God by being a faithful steward of all that is entrusted to us and to have a positive influence on all who come into contact with Chick-fil-A. All right? That's their goal as a corporation. They want to have a positive impact on you. That's why when you go into a Chick-fil-A restaurant, they're always so nice. They, they want you to have a good experience in their store. Did you know, by the way, There's not a grilled cheese sandwich on the menu at Chick-fil-A, but if you ask them to make you one, they will make it. If they have the ingredients in there, and it's within reason, I imagine, they will make it for you. You go try it tomorrow because they're closed today. (laughs) Today's Mother's Day. Did you know that Mother's Day has a mission statement? That's probably an obvious one, or it better be at this point, right? But when Mother's Day was first signed into law, Woodrow Wilson, 1914, He wrote, I call upon the people of the United States to display the flag at their homes or other suitable places on the second Sunday in May as a public expression of our love and reverence for the mothers of our country. So the purpose of Mother's Day is to honor your mother. And you show it, by the way, originally by flying the American flag. Okay, so we've come so far, haven't we, on how we honor our mothers on Mother's Day who says things are getting worse. They're, They're getting better in that field at least. Last example, we're a PCA congregation. According to our denomination's website, the PCA exists to glorify God by extending the kingdom of Jesus Christ over all individual lives and through all areas of society and in all nations and cultures. Most Groups, organizations, whatever, have a mission statement. It defines their vision. It it controls everything they do. And here in Colossians 1, 24 to 25, you have a description of Paul's ministry that sounds very much like a mission statement. This is what Paul is trying to do. And it's not just thrown in there. If you were reading the book through it, it might sound almost like this is kind of just a lull between the high points of the book. No, Paul is very specific in giving this to us. He wants us to know what Christian ministry should focus on. 
what Christian ministry should look like in the church, and what Christians sitting under such a ministry should look like. That's what Paul highlights, and it's what I want us to look at this morning, the nature of Christian ministry. What is church and Christian ministry really all about? Paul's going to tell us that with two statements, two things in to see today. Number one, Christian ministry focuses on Christ. Christian ministry focuses on Jesus Christ. It might sound somewhat obvious, but sometimes it needs to be said. Verses 24 through 27 build up to a climax in verse 27. Let's walk up the steps one by one. Look first in verse 24 about what Paul says regarding his suffering for the Colossians. He says at the beginning of verse 24, Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you. And we've already mentioned it a few times, but remember, Paul did not plant this church. He's never even met these believers, yet he can say his suffering is for them. How is that? Well, let's look at the nature of these sufferings. Paul says, I rejoice in what I suffer for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. Now that may strike you as as a little bit of a strange statement. It's not as strange as it may sound at first reading. The explanation's simpler than we think. Because first of all, we can safely say that Paul is not referring to Christ's redemptive sufferings, that there's nothing missing in Christ's saving sufferings that Paul can somehow complete. Remember what Paul's already said in this letter, especially in that hymn In verses 15 through 20, Christ is sovereign over creation. Christ is sovereign over redemption. He's the head of the body, the church. He holds everything together. If there's some deficiency in Christ suffering for us, then the whole argument of the letter just collapses right there. What Paul is referring to is what we could call the ministerial sufferings or afflictions. Think about it like this. Christ ministered to the Jews. And he suffered, and he died because of what he said. Now the risen Christ has commissioned his apostles to go into the world and to take that ministry to the very ends of the earth, to complete that ministry that Christ began, to preach the gospel to every creature. And as they go forward in that work, they will suffer opposition. Just as Jesus did. There's many places in Paul's letter where he describes his sufferings, particularly at the hands of the Jews. Even this letter, Colossians, is written from under house arrest. Paul suffered affliction in his ministry. Christ suffered affliction, and now Paul suffers the same kind of affliction while he ministers the gospel in places where Christ did not. So that's how Paul can complete the afflictions, what are lacking. And this is where Paul is going. They're not in vain because they are for the sake of Christ's body, the church. So although he's never met these believers, he takes time in prison to write this letter to them, to warn them against false teaching, to proclaim to them the sufficiency of Christ. And so his sufferings are for their benefit. And you and I, as we read this letter, 2,000 years later, we benefit from Paul's sufferings and his imprisonment as well. That's why he could say, my sufferings are for you. And that's also, by the way, why he could say that he rejoiced in his sufferings. He didn't just have a happy mindset. He wasn't just a tough guy. No, he knew that his sufferings were for the spiritual well-being of Christ's people. And that brought him great Joy. What's the very first part of his mission that Paul gives to them? It's that he is to suffer joyfully for the sake of God's people. Paul goes on, though, and he he defines his mission a little more specifically in verses 25 through 27. Look at verse 25. He says, I became a servant of the church by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. Now, Paul's going to do something here that he often does in his letters. He's going to define a concept. He's going to introduce a concept. And he's going to define it a little bit more. And he's going to define it a little bit more. It's like nesting dolls. You've seen those. You open it up and there's a littler one inside and a littler one inside. Paul does that sometimes in his letters. Here he's going to introduce in verse 25 this idea that his commission is to present the word of God in its fullness. 
And that, by the way, would remind the Colossians they need to be following God's word, not the teaching and rules of humans. But in verse 26, he gets more specific, okay? Here in verse 26, he defines the word of God as the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. So Paul speaks of a mystery, something that was once hidden, but has now been revealed. Well, what's the mystery? Paul answers that question in verse 27. To them, the Lord's people, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. What is the mystery? It is the idea that Christ indwells Every believer, that he lives among his people and that he alone is their hope. In other words, what's their confidence that when they die, they will participate in the glorious resurrection, that one day they'll see the glorious new heaven and new earth? It is Christ. What is their hope that they will enjoy the glory of God in this life and escape the corruptions of the world and overcome the sensuality of the flesh, it is that Christ lives within them. And having taken up residence within them, he will live within them forever. And that, therefore, that's Paul's ultimate focus in ministry, to present Jesus Christ to his audience, whether unbelievers or to believers. For unbelievers, what are you hoping in to give you eternal life? But believer, what are you trusting in for your spiritual growth? When sin and temptation assail you, what do you draw on for strength to resist? It has to be your union with Christ, that Christ lives within you. We've been talking about the Ten Commandments in Sunday school, and we made the point today, God cannot give enough rules to keep you from every possible opportunity to sin. At the end of the day, grace must conquer our hearts and enable us to put to death the temptations within you. Paul is challenging us here that we not put stock in our own resources for spiritual growth, that we lean wholeheartedly on Christ. But by the way, Paul also encourages us here that when temptation comes, you're not alone. That God didn't give you a list of rules to follow and say, okay, now you make this work out in your life because if you don't, there's going to be consequences. No, when despair and temptation and loneliness come your way, you are never alone. Christ lives in you to strengthen you, to put to death those temptations to sin so that you can live a life free from evil desire like a father delighting in his son. God does that for us and is working on our behalf. And the last thing I'll say here is that this centrality, the sufficiency of Christ, is where every minister and church should put their focus. This is what controls the decisions that we as a church should make in the area of the ministry. It determines our direction. Because when we follow this kind of focus, we're accomplishing our mission. And when we don't, we're not. So Christian ministry focuses on Christ. Second thing I'll say today, Christian ministry labors for maturity in Christ. Christian ministry labors for maturity in Christ. The reason you have a mission statement is because you have to identify your goal. What are we trying to do? How do we know when we've accomplished our goal? Verse 28, Paul tells us the goal of Christian ministry. He says, he, Christ, is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. What is the goal of Christian ministry? The spiritual maturity of the people of God. That word there in your translation, fully mature, it communicates this idea of total commitment, blameless conduct, not quite perfection. And some translations render it that way. Perfect. We labor so that we can present everyone perfect in Christ. That's a little too absolute. On the other hand, some translations render it as mature, but that almost seems a little bland. Fully mature tries to cut right down the middle. One author explains it this way. The complete and undivided way 
in which a person is oriented towards Christ. Here's what, I'm, here's what I'm getting at. The end product that we as your elders, that I as a pastor, our desire for you is that we see in your life that you're oriented 100% towards God. That you live your life in such a way that, that everything is from Him and through Him and to Him. Whether you're at work, whether you're here at church, whether you're enjoying recreation, whether you're involved in service, that everything is lived in and through Christ. Not, not that we obtain perfection in this life, but that we head towards this goal of commitment to our Lord. That's the goal of Christian ministry. It's what every minister and elder wants for his people, that maturity in Christ. Now, Paul states the goal there. And everything else that he says in the rest of the passage just develops that idea. I'm just going to give you these bullet points quickly, and then we will conclude. If spiritual maturity is the goal, first, what are the tools for the task? What are the tools that Paul uses in order to accomplish this goal? You've got to have the right tools if you're going to do the job right. Well, Paul says in verse 28, he is the one we proclaim admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom. This is just him repeating what he said in verse 27, that Christ is the central focus of all of his proclamation. But he goes on to say that that's going to have a negative and a positive aspect. Negatively, there are times when ministers admonish. They they warn those who might go astray. Positively, on the other hand, there are times when ministers teach. They, they communicate Christian truth so that we can know what we ought to believe, so that we can know what we ought to do, and, and that those things will grip us in such a way that they control our lives. These are the tools God gives for the task of bringing us to Christian maturity. Notice Paul also refers to his hard work. Verse 29, to this end, in order to accomplish this goal, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. Chapter 2, I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. Paul is taking language here from the workforce, from the athletic fields. He strenuously contends. He works hard for the sake of the Colossians' spiritual maturity. Language also may refer to laboring in prayer. Paul's no slothful minister. But at the same time, neither is he self-dependent. Notice he says, I labor with all of the strength, with all the energy that Christ so powerfully works Within me, depending on God, he proclaims Christ and warns and teaches the body in order to bring them to spiritual maturity. Those are his tools. Secondly, what about his vision of the goal? In other words, he said, here's my goal, spiritual maturity. But what does that look like? What does spiritual maturity look like in our lives? Paul answers that question in verse 2. He says, my goal is that they may be encouraged in heart. It's the first thing he mentioned. And the heart in the Bible doesn't refer to your emotions. It refers to who you are on the inside. Paul says, I I want the people of God to have an encouragement that goes to the very core of their being, that, that affects who they are as people. A firm hope in Christ. We're not immune to discouragement. God's people face discouragement. He's not saying we all have to be happy and bubbly. But what he is saying is that when we hit those rocky times, Christ is the one who is our refuge. We're not moving from earthly thing to earthly thing trying to find hope. We're grounded in Christ. We're also, he says, united in love. A mature body will have unity with other believers. Because we love them. Because we love the same things. We all love Christ and his gospel and his word. And when we can forgive those who sin against us. We don't agree on everything. We don't look the same. But we have unity and love in the things that are important. He says a mature Christian will have the full riches of complete understanding. And again, that might sound a little complicated. But but it becomes clear in the light of Paul's overall purpose in his letter. He's saying, I want you to understand that Christ is sufficient for your spiritual fulfillment. You're rich in Christ, and I want you to know that. And he says lastly there, and they will know the mystery of God, namely Christ. Here he is referring again to the mystery. 
And whereas Paul normally talks about our union with Christ, here he talks about Christ living among us and that in Christ we have all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The spiritually mature know that the false teachers can't offer us anything for our spiritual growth. Christ has everything we need. That's how Paul defines spiritual maturity. Thirdly, and we're almost done, he lists a few obstacles to maturity. Verse 4, he warns them about some obstacles that might come their way. This is the whole point of the book, and he captures it in verse 4. He says, I tell you this, everything I've told you so far about Christ, I tell you this so that no one will deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. He warns the Colossians, don't be deceived by things that sound really good. And then he goes on to give them examples of that later in the book. Observe these festivals. Avoid these things. It sounds really good. It sounds like it will bring them to spiritual fulfillment. But Paul is saying, no way. You've got to be grounded in Christ. It is only through our union with him that we can grow. And then lastly, his confidence. Verse 5, he says, For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit, and I delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. This is Paul's optimism, his confidence in the gospel that it will bring the Colossians to his intended goal. Last week we said, beware lest any man don't continue in the faith. He says you will enter into his presence perfect if you continue in the faith. He warns them. But notice here his optimism. He believes that through Christ and through the gospel they will indeed persevere and they will enter into their spiritual fulfillment in Christ. Because the same good news that saved them will also grow them spiritually. And that was Paul's goal. That was, Paul, that was what he wanted for his congregation. He focused on Christ so that they would grow in their maturity in Christ. That's the goal of us as ministers and elders, that let it be our goal as a church as well. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your mercies towards us. We thank you for the sufficiency of Christ. We thank you that he loves us and that he gave himself for us. Thank you that you died and three days later you rose from the dead. Lord, we celebrate the resurrection and we thank you that in that risen Savior we have all the resources we need for spiritual growth. I pray for us as people of God that you would grow us, that you would make us more and more mature. Thank you for the voice of the good shepherd who doesn't chastise us or crush us or condemn us, but through love draws us into the light, away from sin, to know you more and more. Lord, help us to beware of any man-made schemes that seem to promise spiritual fulfillment but would in some way take us away from Christ. And may we go out knowing more of your grace and knowing more of your love, growing and encouraged as we draw near to you. Thank you for your many mercies and bless the rest of this day and our time of fellowship to come in a few moments. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hymn 50, The Lord is My Shepherd. We'll stand and sing this in conclusion. We'll just sing verses 1 and 5. One in five of him, 50. Stand with me, please.